Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford program, at the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium of the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. I hope you'll come back next Wednesday for History's Lunch when Dave Dennis and David Dennis Jr. will be with us to discuss their new book, The Movement Made Us, A Father, A Son, and the Legacy of a Freedom Ride. We're excited to have that. Today, we are delighted to have Jody Skipper to present Behind the Big House, Reconciling Slavery, Race, and Heritage in the South. It's great to have this program in May, which is also Preservation Month. Jody Skipper is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi. She earned her BA in History at Grambling State University, her MA in Anthropology from, Flor uh, yes, at Florida State University, and her PhD in Anthropology at the University of Texas. Skipper is co-editor of Navigating Souths, Transdisciplinary Explorations of U.S. Region, and her book, Behind the Big House, Reconciling Slavery, Race, and Heritage in the U.S. South, has just been published by the University of Iowa Press. Help me welcome Jody Skipper. Good afternoon, how's everyone doing? Good, good. Thanks so much for that introduction, Chris, and, and thank you very much to the Mississippi Department of Archives and History for inviting me to be here today and also to the two museums for hosting at this beautiful venue. Today I'm going to talk about my book, Behind the Big House, Reconciling Slavery, Race, and Heritage in the U.S. South. And I'm going to begin doing that by talking about the project that led to the book and then getting more specific about the people with whom I worked who developed this project and also keep it going to this day. I interviewed several people that I had worked with for several years uh, to get to some substance in the book that I really wanted to get to and think through several things, specifically about race and how people come to do race work in their lives. What do those people look like? What are their aspirations? What do they think about? Trying to get at the how and why, and today I'll focus on one specific person that I will introduce later. This is Burden Place. It's an 1848 antebellum property in Holly Springs, Mississippi. At the time that I began to write this book, it was owned by a man named David Person, who was one of my collaborators for several years. And David, as several others are, are very integral to doing the work of thinking about not just slavery, but about the impacts of slavery in the present, about why slavery still matters so much today. And I'm going to, again, talk about one particular person, and that person is David. But I'll begin a bit broader, a bit wider here in scope, to talk about how this one particular program in Holly Springs in Marshall County, Mississippi, was developed. The Behind the Big House was the idea or the brainchild of Jennifer Eggleston and Chilius Carter, two homeowners in Holly Springs, Mississippi. And the idea came out of the realization that there was a slave dwelling on their historic property, and you could see that slave dwelling here. Uh, it's one building, but there are at least two separate quarters in it, a kitchen, a cellar, and a loft in this one property. In the years 1850 and 1860, at least, we know that nine people, uh, many of them children, six for the most part, were enslaved in this one structure. Chilius and Jennifer really started to think about this idea in the context of its relationship to this historic pilgrimage in Holly Springs, and I'm sure that uh, several of you in the audience and then who are also watching on a uh, live stream might be familiar with this tradition of historic pilgrimages that 
largely began in the state of Mississippi in the early 20th century, around the 1930s. And this was no different uh, in Holly Springs. There were several women in the Holly Springs Garden Club who went to this pilgrimage in Natchez, and they saw this tour of historic homes and other properties and heard about the furnishings and heard some about the historical context and felt like it would be a good thing to do in the city of Holly Springs or a potentially successful thing to do, especially around the city's uh, centennial. And Chilius and Jennifer both became somewhat familiar with that pilgrimage when they moved to Holly Springs. Uh, Chilius purchased, as I have here, uh, the Craft House or the U Craft House, which was developed by U Craft and um, his wife, Chloe Collier, after they inherited the property from her mother in 1842. And you can see the main house here. I showed you the slave dwelling first. This is a site of urban slavery, which means that these two particular structures are in close proximity to each other. The people who were enslaved on that property were meant to serve the people who lived in that main house. 2002, Chilius purchases this property. In 2008, uh, Jennifer Eggleston, who becomes his wife, joins him in Holly Springs, and they developed a historic preservation uh, a historic preservation nonprofit called Preserve Marshall County and Holly Springs Incorporated to think about how to historically preserve sites uh, in Marshall County. And uh, one of the sites that they tend to manage is a Chalmers Institute, uh, a historical educational institution in Holly Springs. But they weren't limited to thinking through that. They really started to think more personally about this property that they own. So they attended this first garden club, their first garden club uh, pilgrimage and tour of homes in 2009 and really started to think about the work that the pilgrimage was doing and some of the gaps. So what's missing here from this particular pilgrimage? And what I have here is what Jennifer says. It was clear that a significant part of the historic narrative was missing. While a number of the silent witnesses, the structures directly related to the slaves' accommodations were extant, the stories of the people who lived and used these buildings was largely being forgotten. She saw a major gap there and wanted to think about what they could do, especially as owners of historic property, to help fill this gap. So they decide to supplement the pilgrimage and they really start to think about how can we add to what the pilgrimage is doing? How can we give it a more full, a more holistic story? And uh, as Chilius said, when we're thinking about antebellum slavery, if you're missing the experiences of the enslaved, you're not just missing part of the story, you're missing a majority of the story. Especially if you think about a place like Holly Springs, where approximately 70% of the population was enslaved. And similarly, approximately 80% of the population today is African American. So that past and the present uh, relate very much in this particular context. So they decide to start their own tour. And what Jennifer does initially is call on a friend, uh, Joseph McGill Jr., who at the time was working as a program coordinator for the National Trust. He had just started what he called a slave cabin project. Now he calls it a slave dwelling project. And what he wanted to do was bring attention to sites of slavery, more specifically dwellings in which enslaved people live, and bring some attention to their historic preservation. Uh, he had been around the Southeast doing a lot of work as program coordinator and realized that a lot of these properties were in disrepair or either being demolished because people weren't aware of their significance or either demolished due to neglect. And he wanted to think about how to change that. And Jennifer was friends with him, familiar with his work, so called him and said, how could we do something like this in Holly Springs? You know, let us know who else is doing this so that we could follow their model. And what they soon realized is that there was no other model. There was no other model for grassroots community tour that focuses on slavery. There were other tours in the country that had alternative slavery tours, 
but not at the time towards that specifically focused on the lives of the enslaved. So they had to develop their own model, and that's exactly what they did. That same year, I got to the University of Mississippi. I was teaching a course on Southern heritage tourism. I was reading a lot about blues tourism, reading about civil rights tourism, but wasn't quite getting slavery tourism, which seemed to be very silent on the landscape here. And I started to wonder, how do you talk about blues? How do you talk about the civil rights movement without talking about their roots of slavery? And I started to do research around this more broadly. Who else in the country is doing this type of thing? And I had no idea that there were folks not too far away from me in Holly Springs, Mississippi, who had just decided to start this program. And I met Joe McGill while I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of South Carolina, kept up with him, and he let me know or made this particular program public. So I called Chilius and Jennifer uh, the year after they had their first Behind the Big House program, uh, which uh, was 2012, and asked them if I could visit as part of a Race and Tourism in the Modern South program that I was doing through the Gilder uh, Lerman project. So they had teachers coming in during the summer to learn about different topics and then visit historic sites that focused on that topic. So through this Gilder Lerman's teacher's visit, I first visited these sites in Holly Springs, visited Chilius and Jennifer, and also visited uh, David Person, who I mentioned earlier, and began collaborating with them that year. And I have done so ever since. So we began this collaborative partnership through my Southern Heritage Tourism class and also through my African Diaspora classes, also through some of our archaeology classes, through the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Mississippi, in which my, do my uh, colleague, Dr. Kellen Frywald, got involved with some of her students to do archaeology excavations to help us think about what type of material culture might be related to the people enslaved on the property? What did they eat? What types of dishes did they use? Those types of things. How did they move around the spaces? So we got involved at multi-prong levels. And, and here you could see at the top left some of the archaeology students during excavation. At the uh, top right, a, a Southern Studies student there, Lauren Holt, is giving a tour in one of the slave dwellings at Burton Place. And there are a couple of students from my African diaspora class, and then that's me on the right visiting Joe McGill uh, for the first time in Anderson, South Carolina, when he had first started his project. So I've maintained those particular uh, relationships and, and played those particular roles uh, as educator to some extent, as collaborator, uh, but also largely training students as docents to work or give tours during this particular program. I got involved uh, in those ways and then also uh, got involved through a project called Gracing the Table, which was developed by David Person and at the time Dr. Alicia Williams McLeod, who some of you might, might know, uh, was chair of humanities then at Russ College. And she had a couple of students who visited the Behind the Big House program its first year. And she and her students met David, and they were having a conversation at the opening reception for Behind the Big House. And they wanted to know, how do we keep these conversations about race going? So at that time, the pilgrimage and at being held at the same time behind the big house was one of the few moments, spaces in which you had people across racial groups talking openly about the past. And David and Alicia and Alicia's students want to think about how to keep doing that kind of work. And they started this racial reconciliation group called Behind the Big House, uh, excuse me, not Behind the Big House, as a, a consequence of Behind the Big House called Gracing the Table. And I got involved in Gracing the Table that second year. So that added another layer to my collaboration. After working with Gracing the Table and Behind the Big House for several years, I 
really wanted to think about what it means to think through that kind of work, what it means to make it accessible, and also what it means to archive it to some extent. So uh, what I did was after receiving a Whiting Public Humanities Fellowship for a year, I decided to start developing these best practices for interpreting slavery workshops. And I did the first one in Holly Springs in 2018. And as a result of that, I developed a website called behindthebighouse.org to help those who might be in local communities, uh, might be small in number individuals or small institutions, who have the will but limited resources to do this kind of work. So I developed this website as a model, a program model for people who were interested. So if you have little to no human resource support like we do, outside of much of our financial support that comes from the Mississippi Humanities Council, and you have some willing folks, what does it mean to think through how to critically and carefully and thoughtfully develop this kind of program. So I did that, and I consider that my first intervention. And that intervention uh, was largely, I, I guess, the product of Chilius and Jennifer for so many years saying that they didn't just want this program to stay in Holly Springs, they wanted it to be a replicable model. So this was one of my ways of helping them to think through how to make this a replicable model. We had some success. In uh, the year 2015, one of my archaeology colleagues who was then in Arkansas, Dr. Jody Barnes, came to visit the Behind the Big House program in Holly Springs, and the next year had developed a Behind the Big House program in the state of Arkansas that still exists. And also, some of you might know that the city of Columbus started their first Behind the Big House earlier this year. So we've had some uh, success at this level of a replicable model. My second intervention here was to write a book, something that I uh, started to think about when I really started to think about uh, how vulnerable this program is, a program that's dependent on historic sites that are privately owned, uh, they take a lot of money to be able to manage, a lot of time, a lot of personal and economic investment that not everybody has. It's an all-volunteer program, so that means it depends on when people are willing and able to help. And we've been very lucky over the years to have that support. But we always knew that every year we did it was practically a miracle. Each year we said, well, maybe we'll do it again next year. And then we'd say, yes, we'll do it again next year. But it was always a very difficult decision to make because of the time and energy that it takes, especially, again, thinking through something like slavery. So what I, when I started to think about writing this book in 2018, I was trying to think about how to best do that. And because I've been so involved with the program and work so closely with other people, I decided to use this method of autoethnography, which is part memoir, part ethnography. So part of it is about my life, how I came to understand and think through race and racism. I can't do work around race and racism if I don't think and feel and speak candidly about that life experience. So I wanted to be able to think through that and also share. And that's largely been the case for my collaborators as well. So part of that project of ethnography was thinking through their lives and how they intersected with this work of doing race, with this uh, effort to do race work and also think about racism. It's also a community autoethnography, which I have defined here. It uses the personal experience of researchers in collaboration to illustrate how a community manifests particular social cultural issues. And for me, that was a very helpful frame to think about how to write about my community partners here, like David Person, which you see in the image, giving a tour to some of the folks who are on the Garden Club's pilgrimage. I wanted to think about my personal experience and then also how that helps to manifest local tourism in Holly Springs, for example, slavery tourism, 
thinking about racial reconciliation. These are all social cultural phenomena that I, would, I was trying to think through at the time. And I thought about how to lay this book out. And I knew that behind the big house, of course, would need some context to how it was developed, uh, some about Chilius and Jennifer and how they came to think through this project. But I also knew that it was going to be important to think through gracing the table. And I had worked with David for several years. You could see David here in the picture at, at the top. And then on his left is Alicia Williams McLeod, co-founder of the Behind the Big House program. At the bottom, you see a couple of uh, her students, Naomi and Joshua, who are with a local Holly Springs resident at one of their early uh, community programs that Gracing the Table did. And I wanted to think about how to tell that story. And I also realized at that time that I couldn't really do that if I didn't have a better understanding of how my collaborators, again, came to do this kind of work. So I decided to start interviewing them after working with them for several years. And I started to do those interviews in 2019 about gracing the table. And when David and Alicia first started this racial reconciliation group, they came up with these basic tenets, uh, goals, uncovering history, making connections, working toward healing, and then taking action as a result of that. And they did that in so many ways. When I got, first got involved with Gracing the Table, uh, they had been invited to help coordinate a tour at Strawberry Plains Audubon Center in Marshall County, which is a historic antebellum property. And they uh, hosted tours of uh, the slave cemetery there, sharecropper cabins, and then also had this discussion about slavery, about the family that came to what became Strawberry Plains with their enslaved property and what that means to the community today. Then that was my initial attraction to getting involved. Uh, each year we also do an African-centered libation ceremony, uh, usually hosted by Wayne and Ricketti Jones, also members of Gracing the Table, who really get us to think about what it means to first honor ancestors before we seek to do work that commemorates them. And that's the purpose of that libation. So uh, we t it's a secular libation where we tend to uh, call out the names of ancestors and then pour libation out to them and really think about what the path they've laid for us means for us in this particular moment. One major thing that's come out of gracing the table is a relationship between David Person and Deb Davis, who is a woman from Edwardsville, Illinois, whose family was enslaved by Mary Burton, the woman who owned Burton Place during the antebellum period. And she was doing some genealogy research, made this genealogical connection, decided to knock on David's door one day and say to him, I think my ancestors were enslaved here. And he basically said, come on in. And that's my very general version. What I want you to hear now is their version of their relationship and how it came to be uh, in the format of a short film that we'll play now. One of the first things on my first visit here was the brick and just the thought that one of my ancestors probably created that sense. brick. And it was the actual brick. And I mean, when you think of being tearful, it's an emotional, a very, very emotional thing. And then after I get over the emotion, they were skilled. That's a skill, a great skill, a needed skill. So that, that gives me pride, too, to know that they knew how to do these things. Oh, my God. I had to call this a fluke because I really hadn't intended to buy this place, but when I heard it was being developed into um, 
condominiums. I didn't like that idea. So I put in a nominal bid just to kind of muddy the waters a little bit. And sure enough, uh, they called me and said, we need your check for X amount. <laughs> and that's how I ended up here. But it's been the blessing of my life because it has, I've been able to open the doors to this house and make it uh, part of the community and part of a community of like-minded people. I noticed that the side door was open and I asked my husband, oh, take me back. I just want to knock on the door and see. Maybe they'll let me see some of it or something. And so when I knocked on the door and I asked for the owner and David says, I'm the owner. And he said, can I help you? I said, well, I understand uh, Mary Burton once owned this home and uh, from my research, she was actually the slave mistress or master of my family. And he immediately just ran out the door, pulled me in the house, hugged me, like, come in, come in. And so it's, that's just been the start of a great relationship and friendship. That's the kind of, uh, of spirit that's within this house. First couple of times I came, it's like almost overwhelming to the point of bringing me to tears. But now it's like I've learned to really walk in it, to live my history. My imagination tells me better what their lives was like just because the house has been kept so intact and the slave quarters have been kept so intact. I think I have a more realistic view of my ancestor, ancestral history, basically. I first came into this um, house, I guess I'll just say it like that. It was the most overwhelming, emotional feeling of a lifetime. Um, just to think, oh, uh, I'm actually in a spot where my great, great, and great, great, great grandparents lived and worked. It's, it's, it's a feeling that it's really indescribable. I, I, I just can't say about to tell you how overwhelmed I was would be just as adequate as I could be about it. English. Oh. It's not English. It was such a gift, our friendship, but it, it provided a strength to move forward and that with a joy. Uh, Deborah expresses so much joy and love and enthusiasm. Mm. And uh, one of the most important things is uh, maybe you don't always get what you want. Maybe people don't follow you. Maybe they don't like what they hear. When you walk through doors like this for the first time, you can't help but feel something. And it's, in all cases, not going to be a great thing but you can see in a person with enough imagination like me, and it just opens your mind up to what really possibly was. I'm sure they felt quite burdened at times and just tired, tired. I, I can feel their tiredness when I really stop and think about it. Uh, it's nowhere to go. Like I said earlier, I can, I can, when I don't want to do it, I say I'm tired, I don't feel like it. They could not do that. And so I'm sure that they were tired to a point of exhaustion at most times. And I just, I thank them for enduring and going through that even when they really didn't want to. It's, it, that's an overwhelming feeling, yeah, to be exhausted. When we speak, I get a strength from Deborah that let it be, let's move forward and don't uh, pause for negativity or resistance. That's not part of it. Our duty is to um, build and to continue it with our own ways that are, is possible. I'm a firm believer that things happen or paths we take, if we just follow whatever, that hidden direction, and that's pretty much what I did that day. It was meant to be, and that's why I call him Uncle David, because <laughs> he has just been wonderful, and the fact that he wants 
true history, that unwritten history, the uncovered history, was not publicized to be known, I'm all in with helping him to do that. We gon' hey, we want we want people to get a real picture of what that history was like. Thanks so much to my colleague at the University of Mississippi, Alicia Steele, and her Lens Collective project that made this particular video possible. You can actually find it and, and a few others through lenscollective.org. Uh, she is a genius in so many ways and was able to invite uh, several students from across the country uh, to come to Mississippi, research sites, interview people, and then develop a film project within a two-day period. And what you see uh, is, is one of the uh, products of that. Uh, there's another film there in which Chilius Carter, who uh, co-developed the Behind the Big House program, is also featured. So please take a look at that. When I decided to organize my book, I mentioned that I knew that Behind the Big House would be part of it. Uh, Behind the Big House comes after me generally talking about my life and how race and racism influenced me, and then shifting to my time at the University of Mississippi and how I came to understand heritage tourism here. And then in chapter four, I talk specifically about my collaborators with gracing the table, including Wayne and Ricketti, who I mentioned, Alicia, and also uh, David Person. And what I'd like to do at this moment is read that section on David from the book so that you could get a sense of how I tried to think through their experiences in writing, but also just the beauty of what they decided to share with me. I don't remember exactly when or how I met David Person, but I believe it was during the Gilder Lerman teacher's visit in 2012. That was my first visit to Holly Springs. I also don't remember my first impression of him, but it must have been like the first impressions of many others. Somehow he's too good to be true. A South Texas native, David became part of the Holly Springs community after retiring there in 2002. He'd been coming to Holly Springs from Goliad, Texas since he was a kid to visit his mother's relatives. In Texas, David was influenced by Goliad's historical significance in the Texas Revolution, as well as by his father's interest in African-American history in Goliad County, specifically African-American cemeteries. David isn't sure where his dad's interests came from, but recalls that African-Americans were part of his father's constituency as a judge. His dad was also multilingual, speaking variants of Texas's European settler languages. David became interested in the amalgamation of Spanish and African cultures and the German, Czech, and Polish cultures that affected his childhood. I interviewed David for the first time in July 2019. By that time, we had worked collaboratively on Behind the Big House and Gracing the Table for over seven years. I'd heard bits and pieces of his life story, but not in detail. After a few minutes of reflecting on his father's relationship to Texas Revolution historians in Goliad, as well as to descendants of those who fought in the revolution, he shifted his narrative to recollect meeting a 91-year-old black woman on one of his recent trips to Texas. He didn't mention her name in our interview that day, but I remembered her from an email he had sent me in December 2018. He forwarded the email with the note, Jay, not sure you ever went to Goliad, coastal plains, lots of history, with a series of photos and another note, lots of Texas and Spanish history here. Met Mrs. Petty, age 91, who remembered lots of family and friends from long ago. Courthouse with hanging tree to left. I responded that I was familiar with Goliad from my time in Texas, but didn't remember visiting. He replied, Jay, truly wonderful. Feel as if something big and totally unexpected will be coming around the corner. P.S. Mrs. Petty and Pix is 91 and knew so many folks, both white and black, from my past. 
She was always working in a German environment. She is very focused without any hint of Southern influence. Just another example. To David, something unexpected was always around the corner, something that would somehow bridge the past and the present for the better. The hanging tree was a concrete thing. He didn't expect to see it, but wasn't shocked by its existence. There was no, I can't believe there's a hanging tree in Goliad in his email. He also didn't expect to meet a black Texan influenced by German cultures, but he wasn't surprised by her existence either. She was just another example of the cultural confluences that he found so interesting. To him, she complicated Southern notions of blackness and represented the ambiguity he seemed to consistently see in people. He complicated her survival, black life, foregrounding the backdrop of a hanging tree, black death, is how that email read to me. It's how much of what he communicated read to me. It was all important, it was all complicated, it was all connected. It's not only how David saw Mrs. Petty's presence, but how he saw his own as well. He was too enmeshed in the nuances of history to take sides. When reflecting on the experience in Goliad, he wondered about Mrs. Petty's vulnerability as a black woman and about when black folks came to Goliad. It was another stream of thought in his curiosity about history and how it intersected with race. David's earliest memory of Holly Springs was visiting the city sometime in the 1950s. Some of his ancestors had moved from Holly Springs to Goliad and still had family connections in Holly Springs. To his grandmother, Holly Springs was heaven. Her husband was from Holly Springs and her mother was born in Waterford, a small town between Holly Springs and Oxford. He described his grandmother as a patrician with little tolerance for mediocrity. She didn't grow up in Holly Springs, but he thinks that she was social, so, socialized by its hierarchy, a post-bellum white planter class. His grandmother culturally transmitted her love for Holly Springs to his mother, who dissimilarly didn't want to live in the past. To her, Holly Springs was the past. David returned to Holly Springs yearly, sometimes without his parents. He is candid about the racism that intersected with some of his elders' classism, valuing the time he spent with them while acknowledging their faults as whole people. In that way, he reminds me of Chilius, a white male with the ability to value an antebellum Southern past without letting its nostalgia dupe him in the present. It's a challenge for many of us as individuals, but it's even more challenging when one's ancestors' wrongdoings as a group negatively affected others historically and today. For a white descendant of racists, it means accepting those ancestors' actions as individually and systemically harmful to countless black folks then and now. Some might admit the former, but not make the leap to the latter, because that would mean taking personal accountability for contemporary privilege. You can't just say that's in the past or that it was my ancestors, but it's not me. Others never even come to acknowledge the racial harms of the past, choosing instead to centralize their white ancestors as not racist or good to the slaves they did have, or good to their black sharecroppers, or poor, or more recent European immigrants, and therefore they couldn't be racist, and so on. As a child, David accepted how his ancestors in Holly Springs normalized racial hierarchies, but his experiences with black Americans in South Texas showed him something different. He was personally socialized, not with a sense of racial equity, but with mutual respect. This was less evident in the time he spent as a child in Holly Springs. Something about David, or about that life experience has caused him to face the difference between how his Texas and Mississippi families associated with black people and what those relationships might indicate about the impacts of slave, slave owner relationships in the present. He can appreciate those ancestors who shaped his childhood and the slave owning ancestors who influenced them. Yet he can critique the effects their actions had and still have on African Americans. I wish that I could bottle it up and spread it all over the world. I don't think that David recognizes this quality in himself at all, which is what makes it seem even more genuine. 
When David returned to Holly Springs in 2002, he was enamored with the place and its romantic appeal. He hadn't been there for nearly 20 years. He had been living in England just before deciding to move and was looking for a place to get a new start. The deaths of several elder family members led to disconnections from those in Holly Springs. He was partially pulled by connections to the family still there. The cousin to whom he was the closest, a trusted confidant, died when David was in the process of moving there, making his transition more difficult. David bought Crump Place and conducted extensive restoration and renovation of the antebellum house, which was erected by one of the founding fathers of Holly Springs and later connected with the family of Edward Hall Boss Crump Jr. Crump spent his late boyhood and teenage years there before moving to Memphis. He controlled Memphis politics for much of the early 20th century and became the most powerful man in Tennessee politics with considerable influence on the state's gubernatorial races. In 2006, David purchased Burton Place, once owned by Mary Malvina Burton, one of the wealthiest antebellum plantation owners in Marshall County. Burton Place was her town home in the city. In 1836, Mary Burton had come to Holly Springs from Rockbridge County, Virginia, along with others from states such as Georgia and North Carolina, where former Chickasaw land sales were heavily advertised. She came with her husband, Dr. Philip Patrick, or Patty Burton, to capitalize on the sales of land there. After a troubled relationship, Patty was abusive and promiscuous. The couple divorced in 1842. Burton was a unique woman during the antebellum era. Not only was she a divorced single mother of three children, but she was able to retain her wealth and build a fortune in cotton after her divorce. To manipulate a legal system preferential to men, Burton's brother, John N. Shields, acted as trustee of her estate at the time of her divorce. As a result, she was able to become a wealthy Marshall Countyan modeling her refined house after those in her native Rockbridge County. Mary Burton had the house and its accompanying slave dwelling built in 1848. She referred to it as the Burton home. Per the 1850 U.S. slave census schedule, Burton enslaved eight persons. By 1860, that number had increased to 87. Eighty likely lived and worked on Burton's rural plantation out in Marshall County. She made her wealth through cotton and that slave labor. Seven enslaved people were recorded as living and working at the Burton home in Holly Springs. They likely lived in the kitchen quarters on David's property, a plainly finished brick building, one room deep and three rooms wide. In addition to the kitchen, the other two rooms might have served as residences and workrooms for enslaved persons. The 1860 slave census schedule notes two slave houses, which might refer to those other two separate rooms. The kitchen quarters on David's property were not only featured on the Behind the Big House tour, but his main house has been a stop on the Garden Club's pilgrimage, which selects a few homes for presentation each year. David purchased the three-acre property for restoration and repair after hearing rumors that a developer was going to buy it to build condominiums. Not only was the antebellum townhome on his property a prime candidate for interpretation on the pilgrimage, but his more inclusive narration of its dependent kitchen quarters comparably made his property a candidate for behind the big house. His persistent belief that other white elders like him with a passion for history could also be inspired to prioritize inclusive narratives makes him an effective race relations mediator. He is one of a few people in Holly Springs whose home is at times an integrated space. In October 2013, David wrote me with an inquiry about how to have better contact with Ole Miss. He wanted University of Mississippi faculty and students to be involved in gracing the table. He began his email by highlighting the initiative as one of Holly Springs' most recent successes. Its basic tenet is, until you heal the effects of slavery, racism will continue. He said, we have been meeting for a year and a half. We discuss openly and confidently, confidentially racism and its healing. Our membership has grown from about eight people to over 35. We have a topic and then we break out into small groups for further discussion. It was succinct, 
as are most of his messages. David genuinely loves people and wants them to feel appreciated. He's the epitome of what an upper-class white male showcasing his private home as a site of slavery should be. Knowledgeable, gracious, sympathetic, and a good listener. He also genuinely wants people to feel included. The more, the better. I was reluctant to join the group, but David insisted. No, he didn't insist, he assumed. How could I not want to? I didn't want to. I reluctantly responded to his invitation to attend my first Gracing the Table event in November 2013. His email invitation predicted that Saturday, November 16th, would be a wonderful morning with a very interesting program in a wonderful place. Unfortunately, we lost David in January of last year, but I hope that through this book, his spirit will remain with us. Thank you. Okay, I think that we're going to take some questions. Yeah. Come on over here. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Who owns Burton Place currently and what's the future of it? That's a good question. I can't remember the name of the owner right now. He is on the faculty at Russ College and I haven't had conversations with him so I can't personally say what the future is but at this time he seems to be a, a you know friendly to at least being a historic preservation stakeholder so that's the hope thank you jody um i don't remember either when i met you but it's been a little bit but i think a, i remember a really long conversation we had in i think it was 2017 or 2018 about wanting to expand the idea of behind the big house and especially to Natchez. And I know that has kind of happened, uh, begun to happen in the last couple of years. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I don't know how much I could personally speak to it, but I do know that I was um, invited to give a symposium by uh, the tourism folks a few years ago as part of the best practices for interpreting slavery workshop. So they seem to really, and, and I think that part of the title was new narratives, right? So as part of a broader attempt to think through these, some of these things. I've also spent some time with uh, Deb Cozy who owns uh, Concord Quarters along with her uh, husband Greg to kind of think through some of these things as well. So there seems to be some movement. I just can't personally say what the dynamics are there. Thank you. Hi. I don't usually start with an introduction, but I think it's applicable in this case. My name is Bill Justice. I spent over 40 years in the National Park Service, seven years of it at Natchez National Historical Park, um, and a lot of other uh, places with similar uh, histories. One of the things that we were doing back in the 1990s is at, uh, at Melrose was trying to turn that site upside down so you weren't so much coming into the uh, the front as you were going through the back because the entrance point was already back at the uh, at the quarters and the dependency so going in through the back was a was a was an option the problem we ran into which leads to my question uh, was that although there are, are a lot of sites that were struggling through the same thing that we were trying to do. Uh, Colonial Williamsburg, notably, was, uh, was going through that. Uh, and there still are right now. The network, the network isn't as well known. I mean, there's places like Cane River Creole, Whitney Plantation, um, uh, Kingsley Plantation in Florida, uh, Gullah Geechee. The, um, 
the, the network isn't well known. And my, my question that I was leading to is, you talk a lot about the relationships there in Holly Springs and how you built that. Did you reach out, and it sounds like you touched base in Natchez, but it sounds like it, 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 it wasn't exactly the same thing as we were trying to do. Um, were you able to touch base into that network and see what was happening elsewhere? Uh, and if so, what did you learn from that? Yeah, I'm not sure that I uh, touched base into that network per se, but I am very uh, aware. I um, was a student at Florida State University and worked for the Timucuan Ecological and Historic Preserve at the time. So I'm familiar with a lot that's going on with Kingsley and a lot of other things. So I didn't talk about that here, but much of that experience has informed how I think about the work that I do now. So I can't say that I know all of the specifics, but I do have a very, I think, general understanding or pretty wide breadth of what's going on. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you. But my question is, do you know whether or not there are still any slave shanties on the grounds now? I mean, I saw the one where the connected to the big house, but are there any shanties still there where other slaves lived? So not uh, in the, so in, in Holly Springs, in the urban context or the city of Holly Springs, there may be about 20 or so of those that are laid out like the one at David's property and Chilius's property where you have this main house and then the slave dwelling right next to it. But because those didn't operate as plantations, you don't really have the kind of sham shanty ramshackle cabins that we're normally accustomed to. Those would have been more out in rural Marshall County. So the sites of slavery that we're talking about were people who were living right next to their owners and their entire job was to service their owners, uh, make sure they were fed, change, uh, you know, deal with chamber pots, garden, cook, also take care of their personal families. So you might have had someone maybe in the role of a chambermaid. Uh, there would have been a cook, uh, someone who was likely a valet. And then in the case of the craft house, several children. I'm not quite sure what their roles might have been, but I think that they were probably running back and forth in between the slave dwelling and the main house as messengers. Uh, for the most part. These are 24-7 jobs, so very different than the labor you would have seen out in the rural places. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I guess this is less of a question and more of a validation. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate what you have done, and I come from a background where at my university it required three semesters of African diaspora <laughs> to graduate. And what that does is it grounds you in a way that you can let go of the anger, you can let go of the shame, and you can move forward with a sense of pride and with a sense of understanding. And there's so much fear in the world right now of the truth and the reality of what happened in this country in particular that this book and the premise that you have of finding a way to do it that is respectful and and um, kind of forward looking, I just it really resonates with me, and I really appreciate that. And I think that that is exactly how we need to address that and understand that there is a ton of shame, and there's a livid when you find out what and how um, slaves were treated and lived. But honestly, because you see roots and you see all these things, but when you really get into the nitty gritty of it, it is horrific. And that exhaustion that she spoke of, of being tired and not being able mm -hmm. to take a day off or not say for fear of being beaten or hung or all sorts of horrible things that happen. And, and so I thank you for, for writing this book and I thank you for, for putting your mind on it and giving us a map of how to go forward with this. And I hope that more people from every kind of background and you can use the word race can look at it without fear and and learn from you because that's the only 
solution, I think. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, and what's the name of the university? Howard University. Shout out to Howard yeah. for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I come from a place of the people who actually have to tell the stories. And like Bill, I'll, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Keena Graham. I'm the superintendent of the Megar and Murley Evers Home National Monument. And so uh, working for the National Park Service and a big part of my uh, career has been the person of being the storyteller. And, and now I supervise people who have to do the storytelling. So I worry about them. And being in that position where you have to tell stories uh, of people and events where it's very traumatic several times a day, multiple times a day. And in the case of Natchez, for example, they will soon be telling the story of a slave market and people being bought and sold several times a day. Um, we may be telling the story of Emmett Till, who that story of trauma of a child that has been you know, tortured and murdered several times a day. Mm -hmm. And in my case, of a man who was murdered in front of his children several times a day. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal and take care of the people who have to tell that story and stories like this several times a day to people? How do we take care of them and bring them out of that and also deal with people who will react to that differently. I worked at the Robert E. Lee Memorial, that was one of my first jobs, and a man wanted to punch me for talking about Robert E. Lee being a slave owner. Yeah. Thanks for the question, and I wish I had a clear answer for you, because it does require a lot of caretaking. And you know, I, I think that's where we really have to think about what a multi-prong approach looks like so many of the reasons that people like you doing this work take on a disproportionate burden is because our other institutions haven't done it or don't do and sometimes this might be the first time that people have to face this so talking about the person who gave the example in your example of robert e lee and then there are the others on the other end who do this over and over again. And the reality is a lot of people get exhausted and just stop doing that kind of work. And you know, for me, I really try to think about um, what might be a way to build a structure that could better do that. And I think people would need such a broad supportive network of support in order to be able to do that. And I think that those are the things we need to start thinking about. Uh, one thing in my experience at the University of Mississippi is that I came into a situation where I was teaching a class. I took students to Holly Springs. I knew that it might be hard for some. I mean, the reality is for some, just seeing a bowl of cotton in David's house was traumatic, mm -hmm. right? And what we did was hire um, a psychotherapist to come in and help us to think through some of these things. We just really didn't know what to do. We had um, a volunteer pass out. You know, people cry, people get upset. And it's, it's, a, it's a psychoanalytical issue, not necessarily something that historic preservationists are trained to do. And I think exactly. those are the people who really have to help you do this kind of work because my first response might be, oh, you're crying to grab your arm, mm -hmm. right? And we were told, take a step back and let people have it. You know, so there are people now who are thinking more about this, but I really think that's where that work has to be done. I suggest psychotherapy. Hello. Hi. I, I, I really enjoy the presentation. Thank you. I, I, I have um, two questions, and I, I, I hope you didn't cover it while, while I left the room for a few minutes. But the, the first one, um, the, the, this whole um, truth telling has become uh, po politicized under the, the um, this was the mind block. Uh, uh, 
what's the mind block? Critical race theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I was having a mind block mm -hmm. there, but um, it, it it some some people um, seem to to think that any telling of this history is going to uh, affect young white children in, in particular. And uh, I'll, I'll stop that one there. And the number two issue is um, there are lots of uh, discussion about reparations. And I want to know um, if, if, if you discussed it, looked at it, or what your thoughts are. Yeah, thank you for those two. I guess for the, the critical race theory piece is something that I could go on and on about with probably without much clarity. But I guess I like to shift the narrative in a way or shift how I ask these questions because uh, you posed it in a way that I think they pose it, right? That they're afraid or, well, may, they might not say that they're afraid, but that's how it's interpreted. There's some fear that white children will be impacted. I don't think that that's what critical race theory is about. I think critical race theory is about the fact that white children have already been impacted. If they weren't, they wouldn't have been on the front lines of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think that what a lot of this is about is preventing them from intersecting and really just seeing other people as the same as they are. I think that's where that fear has come out of in the past few years. And I can't say that's how everybody thinks about it. I just think there's a different dynamic going on there. I think that's the fear. The second part about reparations, again, I, you know, it, I guess my personal feelings about that changes over time, but I do, I think repair work looks like a lot of things. And for me, the work that Chilius and Jennifer and David and others who are white do is part of that repair work. So, you know, their arguments are, are um, uh, proposals about whether that should be economic or something else. I don't blame people for wanting any type of repair that they feel like they need. Repair needs to happen. That can't happen without acknowledging that there's been damage done to black people to begin with. We haven't even gotten there in this country. But in terms of this work, I do consider the work that they do a form of repair work. And as a historic preservationist, that's the lane that I've decided to stay in. We have a question from the live stream, and I'm going to ask it because it's the appropriate time. Sandra Bingham asks, how can I obtain a signed copy of her book? <laughs> if you move quickly, <laughs> you can buy one right over here, and, uh, and I'll, I'll contact Sandra about that. Uh, we do have a couple of copies left um, of this tremendous book. I've read it. It's really great. Thank you all for being here. I hope that you come back next week for Dave Dennis and David Dennis Jr. when they will be talking about their book, The Movement Made Us, for today. Help me thank Jody Skipper for this tremendous program.